Today, we are starting a new sermon series in the book of James. And I have went ahead and titled the sermon series, Talk is Cheap. Okay? Uh, which I'll explain here in a few minutes. But um, think of this. Uh, so when I think of talk is cheap, there's a few different levels to it. Each and every single day, we are just flooded with a wave of advertisements and people calling us to follow what they're doing or invest in what they're offering or buy their product because if we get that thing it is going to give us true happiness it's going to make our life better and we will experience true joy okay these things are trying to tell us that what they have to offer is better i mean even just like you can you can click around on on the tv station right channel surf on your tv if anybody does that anymore I don't know. I don't even have like cable or or satellite or anything because we just use Netflix. Um, but even on YouTube, every single YouTube video you click on, actually, you don't even have to click on them because they're all just autoplay now, right? You can just watch one video and it will play for hours, and you will get sucked in a trance, like Ooh, and watch YouTube for hours and hours. But at the at the begin, not that I've actually done that. I'm just saying. <laughs> at the beginning of every video, and even in between some of them, there's advertisements. Some of them you can click and say skip. Some of them you can't. But whatever that advertisement is, it's coming at you, and it is saying, "Listen, I have something to offer you that is going to make your life better." Not only do we get that all the time from advertisements and different companies trying to sell their products to us. Um, I mean, nobody can make false promises better than a politician. Am I right? When election time comes around, you just start seeing the promises roll out. Okay? And right then and there, in those instances, we can definitely say, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap from the advertising companies and the people that are making the products and trying to sell them. Because whatever it is they're trying to sell you, I guarantee it will fall short of what they're actually trying to say. And, a, and politicians, it's so easy for them to stand up in front of crowds and tell everybody what their promises that they have. You know, just for in the short, in, in the near future, we end up seeing that they fall short of sticking to their promises. And talk is cheap. So it's really hard to take advertisements and politicians seriously. Now, those are a couple of levels of this talk is cheap. But if we get dig down even a little bit deeper, we will see how talk is cheap in the church and in Christians' lives. And that is what James really tries to hit home um, hard on with us. In the book of James, okay, we're going to be going through the book of James for the next few months, uh, verse by verse. We're not going to skip anything, even the hard stuff. We're going to go through that too. And James is going to call the church to action. He's going to call people to action because he wants the theoretical to actually go down and become practice. Right? You can't have theory without practice. You have to have both of them together. And if you do just have theory, well, then it's useless because it's not actually doing anything. Right? Like I could have taken all of my um, courses to be a mechanic and gone through my entire apprenticeship and learned all the book smarts and got straight A's on all of the exams. But if I never actually went into the shop and turned a wrench and pulled an engine out and changed a hydraulic pump and tested hydraulic pressures and all that stuff with my hands, if I hadn't have done the practical work, then the theory is useless. It's just useless information that I have in my brain. It's not ever gonna do anything. And that's what James is calling us to. He's saying that he doesn't want God's people to be the type of people that have cheap talk. Because all too often, just like the advertisements that say, hey, we've got this amazing thing. Just like the politicians say, hey, if you follow me, I promise this will happen. Christians say, hey, Jesus is the answer. Hey, he brings me great joy. Hey, I have peace that passes understanding. Hey, prayer works. Hey, come to church with me. And on the other hand, they still cling to worldly values. 
and allow the world to shape them and mold them and influence them more than God and his word. And so that's, that's what we're... Now, James... Uh, so that's going to be the whole sermon series all throughout. James has so many different practical things, which is why I love this book, because I'm just a practical guy. Okay, I like to somebody to tell me what to do, and I go and do it. Okay, uh, where the theory becomes practice. I like that. And James is doing that all through his book. So there's going to be lots of commands and practices that he gives us and, and helps us to walk through life. Um, James actually says... What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? So that's kind of the whole crux, the whole purpose of James's letter to these people. Now, let's just talk uh, for a few minutes about who this James guy is. All right. Uh, Obviously, he wrote one of the books of the Bible. Okay. And James was uh, one of three main leaders kind of at the hub or the, the, the central workings of the New Testament church, the early church. Okay, so you've got three guys um, that are mainly th- the main leaders in the early church. You've got John. John looked after a network of churches in Ephesus and throughout Asia Minor. Okay, and then you've got Peter, who led the Jews of, uh, of Pontius, uh, Galatia, and Cappadocia. And then you have James, who oversaw the Israelites of the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So he's one of the three main leaders. He's leading a network of new churches that are, you know, popping up all over the place. And he's writing this letter to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So James starts the book like this. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Greetings. So he's leading a large group of people, a group, a network of churches. So this man is a big deal back then, and his teachings and uh, things that he wants to tell us should still be a big deal to us today. Um, now, he, he starts off with James. He's addressing his name, a servant of God. Now, he doesn't say it right here. But a reality that we need to understand about James is that he was actually Jesus' brother. He's Jesus' half-brother. Okay? He doesn't, ad- he doesn't say that right here because he's trying to address the people with his letter with some humility. You know, he doesn't want to pull the brother card. Yeah, I'm, I'm God's brother, so listen to me. He doesn't want to be known primarily for being actually Jesus' brother. He wants to be known for being something else. He wants to be known for being a servant of Christ, a slave of Christ, committed, devoted follower of Christ. That's what he wants his main identity to be amongst the people, that he is a servant of Christ and that Christ is, in fact, his Lord and his Savior. Now, when I say that James is his brother, Uh, There's actually a little bit of controversy around this, especially in Catholicism, in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church believes that Mary was a virgin when she got pregnant with with Jesus, which she was. And then she gave birth to Jesus and then continued to be a virgin all the way until the very end of her life. And she died a virgin. Therefore, she never had any other babies. Therefore, Jesus had no siblings. Okay? But... I would say that that is incorrect. (laughs) And so would most of evangelicalism. So, if we look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, so Joseph has this dream, okay, and, and the Lord confronts him in a dream and says, listen, Joseph, she didn't cheat on you. Actually, I put the baby in her tummy. You still need to go and marry her. And when the son is born, call him Jesus. And Joseph wakes up and goes, oh my goodness, this is insane. And this is what he does. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Now it says, he knew her not. You guys know what that means? (laughs) 
They didn't consummate the marriage. He didn't know her in a physical, intimate way. Until, it says, until she had given birth to a son. So when we read this, you know, it, it shows us that they had every intention to wait until the baby was born, but then that was it. They weren't waiting anymore. Right? Okay. So that, that has to do with, um, that's one verse. Now, there's many verses that I could hit on all day long trying to explain that James is actually Jesus' brother. But I'm just going to hit on one more, and we find it in, uh, in Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. It says this. Um, so Paul is writing this, okay? Then, after three years, when he's planting churches, after three years of planting churches, um, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, which is Peter, and remained with him 15 days. That's a big meeting. It's a long meeting. Have you ever had a 15-day meeting, Bob? No, me neither. It's a long meeting. It was probably awesome. Peter and Paul hanging out, two heavyweights of the early church. And it also says this, But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. All right? James is Jesus Christ's half-brother. They share the same mom, but have different biological fathers. James's biological father is, is Joseph. Jesus' biological father is God. God the Father. So, why didn't James mention this in his introduction? Like I said, because he wanted to approach the crowd and approach the people, the 12 tribes, with all humility, putting first his identity as a servant of Jesus, not his brother. And he didn't have to mention it either because actually everybody probably already knew that he was Jesus' brother. All right? Okay. So, now that we know a little bit about James, let's just kind of dive into the first few verses that James has for us in this book. But before we get there, I just want you to, to think about a few things. So, in your lifetime, have you ever had something really precious to you taken away from you? Have you ever had something, an item, an object, a person, a relationship, a life, an experience, a situation, a career, a job, an emotion, a value? Any, have you ever had something very, very precious and valuable, valuable to you robbed of you, taken away from you? I have. I've had a few things. But one thing in particular that you might not think r should really affect me all that much, but it has. Um, in my childhood, it's, it's crazy to think how a, a person's childhood can really shape their entire life. I mean, I remember just a, a, a while ago, a couple months ago, I was having breakfast with an older man in his mid-70s at A&W. And the first thing that he said to me when we started talking about life was he went all the way back to when he was an eight-year-old little boy and something that his family had done to him that hurt him and affected him. And he's talking about it when he's in his mid-70s and he's breaking into tears because it still affected him. It's, and, and so in my childhood, now uh, it might not be as, as significant as that man or maybe what you guys might have experienced, but in my childhood, I had something that just brought me so much joy. And this thing that brought me so much joy actually ended up going in a direction where I thought it was going to bring me more joy. And it actually took the joy away from me. And that was baseball. <laughs> I loved playing baseball. I played baseball since I was two years old, all the way up until I was 19 in college. And I still play it today. But there was a turning point for me at 14 years old. Up till the age of 14, um, you know, I was, I was a good hitter. I couldn't run worth the beans. Everybody called me Forrest Gump. And I'd be running like super slow. They're like, run, Forrest, run! I'm like, shut up, guys. Stop making fun of me. So I would just hit dingers. <laughs> I could hit really well. I had a good arm. I could play field. And I could pitch. And I, God blessed me with the ability to be able to pitch really 
really well. So well, in fact, that at 14 years old, I was throwing 84 miles an hour, and there was this team in Kelowna that was a part of kind of an elite league called the Premier Island League. So you got single A, double A, triple A, Premier, and then they made this other one called Premier Island League, which was the highest in BC and was one of the highest in all of the country um, for kids 18 and under, high school kids. And so at 14, this team in Kelowna, they got me to come try out for their team, and I could, I could keep up. Like, I was doing good on the mound, but I couldn't hit the other guys because they were throwing too hard. I couldn't run worth the beans still, so they didn't want me to hit and run anyways. So all I did was pitch. I only pitched every four games. Okay? And all of a sudden, I wasn't playing with my friends anymore that I had fun with, all the guys that were my same age. Now I'm stuck on a team with all these dudes that are 17, 18 years old that are just cruder than all get out, you know, um, and, and just, like, I won't even get into it, how they treated women and different things. And, you know, the way that they kind of rookied me and made fun of me and took their sweaty jocks and put them in my face and all this, different, like, at 14 years old. And then when I throw a bad game, the coach drags me into his hotel room down on the lower mainland. My parents aren't around. And there's two coaches and they're yelling and screaming in my face that I sucked. And then I've got a silver spoon and I got everything handed to me and I need to step up and actually work for this. All of a sudden, the thing that brought me so much joy was stressing me out and making me kind of recluse into myself. And it was no longer even fun at times until a few years later again, when I kind of grew a little bit older and matured, was playing with the same age group of guys and, and stuff. But still, it, it just was never the same anymore. Uh, so the joy that I experienced playing ball, though we didn't know, me and my dad, my parents, didn't know that it was going to rob the joy from me, it did. In the pursuit of making it better, it actually made it worse. Unintentionally, but nonetheless, that joy was taken away. Now, we've all experienced different things in life uh, where something was taken away from us. Like I said, maybe it was a relationship. Maybe it was a career. Maybe it was something that you felt called to do. Maybe it was a volunteer position in a ministry, in a church, or in a nonprofit organization or something. Maybe it was something that you were investing in that all of a sudden you couldn't do anymore. Like, all of us have experienced something. Maybe... It's your health that's been robbed from you and causes you to find it difficult to experience joy in life anymore. Now, the reason I say this is because what James is about to teach us here when we get into his word, or into God's word, James's letter, he's going to teach us um, some very important things about joy and about having it being robbed from us in our lives. So let's just, let's just jump right in um, here in verse 2. Okay. And I believe I got it up on the screen here. So James says this in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. <laughs> so this, this seems completely counterintuitive, personally, to me, and, and maybe to you, too. And oftentimes when we read verses like this, it doesn't make any sense. You know, and, and either we just kind of go like, oh, that's weird, and we flip past it, or we start digging into it, and it confuses us. And by God's grace, hopefully he reveals to us and allows us to see what the Bible is meaning here. But it's counterintuitive for us to think that we should count it as joy when trials come in to our life. That doesn't make any sense on the onset. But before we can really understand what James is telling us here, um, let's get a grasp on what he means about joy. We need to understand what he's talking about when he says joy. Because in different areas of the world, different cultures, different people, in different situations... Joy is going to look different and perhaps mean something completely different than what James is talking about. So what kind of joy is James talking about? James is talking about 
Christian joy. And, um, and I got this awesome quote from John Piper. Any of you guys listen to John Piper? Nobody knows John Piper? Okay, some people know about him. He's just a beauty. He's awesome. Um, John, Piper, John Piper says this, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Spirit by causing us to see the beauty of Jesus Christ in his word and in his work. Now that is the type of joy that James is talking about. That is the definition that we need to anchor ourselves in when it comes to joy for the Christian life. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes breaking that apart so that we can understand more clearly what uh, John Piper's definition of joy is here for the Christian life. So, Christian joy is a good feeling. Okay, that, that kind of surprised me when I heard it come from John Piper because he's more of like a, uh, you know, all about the suffering servant and Christian life is hard and, you know, repentance and, and all this stuff. And, and to kind of avoid chasing after the experience Okay, because there's so many churches nowadays that are actually like chasing after and groping after experience. God, give me a new experience. God, show yourself to me. God, I want to feel something. God, and then they, they, so they go to these big extravagant worship services where there's amazing bands and light shows and smoke and uh, emotional music and emotive messages and stuff like that so that they can kind of be ushered up into the presence of God by feeling good. That's not what, what John's talking about. Um, what he is talking about is he's talking about that Christian joy is experienced in our emotions. And emotions are crazy things because emotions actually, most of the time, we cannot control them. You just can't control emotions. But if the real joy that we've experienced in Christ is true, then our emotions will be stirred up on their own, involuntarily. Kind of like, just picture this, okay. So, Teresa, how many of you guys hike? Anybody hike? Go hiking in the mountains, um, hiking in the fields, hiking in the pastures. <laughs> That's not really hiking, that would be walking. Anyway, Teresa loves hiking. And when we lived in Sparwood, there's tons of different hiking trails and a whole network of trails there. And one night she was taking a um, our, our couple of our kids for a walk and she had Cody. And at the time, he was only like four years old, so about Coulter's age, just a little peanut, barely walking along in his great big huge winter boots, you know, clunking along, and it's dark, and they're in a trail, only like two blocks from our house. And then, and then all of a sudden, Sarisa had no choice, had no control over her emotions, but her emotions just skyrocketed and spiked into like, uh, spine gripping fear because she heard a mama cougar howling and hissing right beside them. And they're walking along the trail and Cody just went off right over here. There's a little tiny hill and he started walking up the hill because he wanted to slide down it. And as he started walking up the hill, she heard this like really loud growl and, and meow. I don't even know what to call it from a cougar. And she was just like stiff, gripped in fear. And she grabbed the kids and they all held hands and faced the sound and like walked backwards up towards our house, hoping that this thing didn't come out at them. And they got back to the home and she was crying, hysterical, freaking out. Ryan, Ryan, you won't believe this. Ryan, this is crazy, Ryan. And then, so we got on the horn and we're calling the right people that we think we need to call to get this cougar out of here. And they're like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. They're up there all the time. We're like, what? It's right beside our house. There's people walking there all the time. Ah, oh, it'll be fine. Anyways, in that moment, she couldn't control that emotion. It just happened. And then emotions, you can't shut them off either. Either They've got to bleed off. They take time to come down. So, this joy that James is talking about is emotive. It does influence our emotions without a question. And it should. So, Christian joy feels good. It should feel good. And if it doesn't, something's wrong. Uh, the next thing is, so it, it's a good feeling in the soul. So it starts in the soul. Uh, not in the body, but in the soul. The body may be affected, but that is not joy. Those are effects from the cause 
the soul is experiencing joy. Okay? So the soul imparts virtue upon the body to act and to feel. So the root of Christian joy starts in the soul and then actually plays out in the way that we feel. Okay? And um, so Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the spirit. This joy, this Christian joy, is a fruit of the spirit. And the spirit produces inside of us um, that begins in our soul and comes out of our body so that we could experience it. It's a type of joy that we could never manufacture on our own. It is joy that only God can give us by the power of his spirit inside of us. So this is good news because that means even in situations that are hard, if we're having a tough time at school, if we're getting bullied, or if we're failing classes, or uh, having a hard time at work, or whatever it might be, or we're getting persecuted, or we're dealing with health issues, even in these moments, thank God it's not our responsibility to um, manufacture our own joy. God, the Holy Spirit, will actually cause us to experience joy even in the hard times, which is incredible. So it's produced by the Holy Spirit, and He causes us to look and gaze upon Jesus Christ in his beauty, the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us, the source and the substance of our joy. In his word and in his work. So the Holy Spirit allows us to understand this and to find Christ in it and to be transformed by the gospel in here. But also in his work. So when we're hanging out with our friends, when we're on the golf course, when we're eating in a restaurant and we're enjoying delicious food, we see the sunset or the sunrise, like the sunrise this morning was incredible. I had to call Kylie out. Actually, it was like 6.30 in the morning or 6.45. The sun hadn't even crested over the horizon yet, but it was just like deep, deep, deep red and then orange, blue, and black. It was incredible. Like that kind of stuff, the Holy Spirit causes inside of you to appreciate it and give glory to Christ. You can see Christ everywhere in his creation and what he is doing in and through his people. And in those moments, we can experience true Christian joy. Now, this is the type of joy that James is talking about. And this type of joy is joy that nobody can take away from you. Nobody can take it away from you. No circumstance can rob you of it. It is with you forever. This is good news. This is what James is also saying right here. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. He doesn't say if you meet trials. He says when you meet trials. There's going to be times in life where life sucks. It's brutal. You lose a loved one. You, whatever. You get in a car accident. Like st Bad stuff in life happens. What are you going to do in those moments? Where is your faith anchored? Where is your life, what is your life built on? in those moments. That is absolutely paramount because if your life is built on Christ and you experience joy from him and only him, true Christian joy, then you can even experience joy in those hard times when they do come because they are coming. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So this is the type of joy that he's talking about. And you need to know that nothing can take it away. Because that gives us security, and that gives us hope. Um, now, you know what else is true in this reality that is actually kind of mind-blowing? Uh, it, it blew my mind when I read this quote as I was studying for this sermon. Um, this guy brought something to light in my mind that I'd never thought about before in regards to going through trials and suffering and still experiencing joy. Because like I said, that's kind of counterintuitive. It doesn't really make any sense. But this makes... This kind of gives us a different perspective on um, Christian joy in hard times, okay? So I got this quote from this guy that is just, it, it kind of blew my mind when I read it. Um, and so this is what it says. The guy's name is Marshall Seagal. He's a writer. I don't know if he's Steven Seagal's brother, whatever. Um, but he's a writer. He's a writer for Desiring God. And he says this. 
I used to think Satan loved suffering, that it was his weapon of choice against our faith. But while he certainly tries to make the most of it, I now suspect Satan secretly hates suffering. He's simply seen it draw too many people closer to Christ. He has watched for thousands of years while God has taken all that he meant for terrible evil and worked it for undeniable good. That's crazy. That Satan would actually see suffering in a Christian life as something that he hates and despises because he knows there's a good chance that that suffering and hardship and trial is going to actually take the person and push them towards the cross and drive them to their knees and make them depend on God only for their faith to be bolstered even more, to be built up, to become more steadfast. This is incredible. That is the type of joy that we can experience. That is why we can experience joy in hard times. Because we know what is coming. We know that what the effects are going to have on our life. We know that God can use those sufferings to actually make something amazing in our lives. James carries on and he says this. He says, um, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. These trials produce something inside of you. They are of, of some benefit to you and your faith. They are like fertilizer that brings exponential growth to your faith in Christ. These trials oftentimes, like I said, drive you to your knees and to the cross in prayer, in utter dependence upon Christ. Uh, David Mathis puts it this way, in suffering, we can discover how deep the reservoirs of Christian joy run. It's not up there. <laughs> but in suffering, we can, we can discover how deep the reservoirs of Christian joy run when we're in suffering. So when we look to Jesus, when we're thrown into the wilderness of suffering, and we look to Jesus, he is going to bring us to secret sanctuaries of peace, strength, hope, and even joy. So it must really tick Satan off. Uh, when in our sufferings, we end up focusing on the treasure that it produces rather than on the suffering itself. It ticks the enemy off when we look at the treasure that our suffering produces rather than looking at the suffering itself. And that's what brings us great joy. And so uh, James carries on and he says, Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So this is an ongoing process. Your faith is not perfect now, but it can grow and can continue to grow all throughout your life. And as you trust in Christ with the small things, you will learn to trust in him more and more and more with the bigger things that are happening in your life. And you will become more and more okay with how things actually turn out. You'll end up starting to be okay if he doesn't answer your prayers exactly the way that you wished he would answer your prayers. Um, my good friend Haley here and, and all of us in the room, uh, most of us know Haley. And Haley and Brendan together have been struggling for about a year and a half, almost two years, with a very significant health problem that Haley, that Haley has. And it, and it has to do with her breathing. Oftentimes, um, she feels like she's suffocating. She can't breathe. Sometimes it will go on for days and days. And it is so difficult that she feels like she's in a, the darkest place that she could ever possibly be imaginable in life. And then other days, it only lasts for a few moments or a few hours. And then there's some reprieve. Okay. But Haley's been struggling with this for a long, long time. And, um, and actually, she was just sharing with me yesterday, Brendan and Haley, um, they, would, they would like to share a full testimony of what God's been doing in their life the last year and a half, and it's really inspiring. And I'm going to wait for that to come so that you guys can hear it from them. But just one part of this that I want to say is that in the midst of all of that 
pain, that anxiety, that stress, that depression, that darkness, the doubting, God showed up and God showed himself to that family in such a way where Haley could once again experience joy, so much so that she actually um, named her daughter's name, her middle name, Hope. Because now she knows that she has hope. Yet again, a secure hope that is not going anywhere. A secure hope and a joy that nobody can take away. Now that doesn't mean that Haley is completely healed. God has done amazing work in her life. But she still does struggle with breathing and and different things. and, And having a hard time. And still praying for full healing. But I just want to read this to you guys. Okay, uh, a part of her testimony. I haven't recovered. I still fight a constant daily battle with this feeling of suffocation. Some days are terrible. Some days are surprising uh, gift of relief. When people tell me that they are so glad I'm better, it's hard for me because I know I'm not. I know I'm only 75% of the Haley I once was. I know that sometimes I still struggle with my thoughts, but I also know that God is sustaining me. I know he is caring for me. I know he understands my pain. I know he has given me a new hope. I still pray for healing, and I know it will come whether it is this side of heaven or not. I am praying it will be this side, that I am restored 100% so I can reclaim um, an active life here on earth. But until then, I cling to hope. And I thank God for the ways he sustained me in my darkest nights and continues to sustain me now. In that quote, Haley is saying, it is well with my soul. Lord, I know you can do this, but I'm okay with whatever you do decide. Because I'm looking forward to that day, she said either this side of heaven or the next side of heaven. She knows that she's going to be 100% restored. She's going to be healed. She's going to be reconciled back to her heavenly father. And that brings her hope. And that gives her the Christian joy in the moment, in the trial, that's going to be allow her to carry forward through life, still trusting in God's goodness. Look, so I want you guys to trust in Christ. Pray to Jesus. Lean on Him in the midst of the trial because they are coming, various kinds of them. And in them, you can still even have Joy, inexpressible joy, joy that is hard to explain, but it is something that God, the Holy Spirit, produces in your soul. And you know, um, there was another one that went through trials, uh, various kinds of trials, hard trials. And in the midst of those trials, he too experienced joy. In fact, this one that I'm talking about the difficult trials that he went through, it was, the, it was the joy itself that actually allowed him to endure the suffering, to endure the pain, to endure the suffocation, to endure the mocking. And that's Jesus. It's joy itself that was placed before him that allowed him to endure the cross on your behalf so that you might be able to experience true and abundant joy in the midst of suffering as well. And so we see this in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says this, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You see that? It was the joy that was set before him that allowed him to endure the cross. Despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So what was this joy that was placed before Jesus that allowed him to endure the cross? Is it different than our joy? It's the exact same joy that Haley looks forward to. It's the exact same joy 
that Roy looks forward to and Bob and Nathan and Mervyn and Sarisa and everybody in this room that puts their faith in Jesus Christ. It's the same joy that Christ had that was put before him that he endured the cross that is put before us so we can endure the race that's been given to us. And that joy is we are going home to see dad. We're going to be reconciled with our father. We have a place around his table. We're actually seated at the right hand of God in Christ. Ephesians said that we are in Christ and we hold the same position as Jesus beside the Father on the right hand as his kids. It's that truth, that eternal promise that brings us joy even in the midst of trial and suffering. And that's why nobody can take it away from us. And that's why no circumstance or trial can take it away from us. It's secure. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for James and just how blunt and a matter of fact he is. And how he knows we're going to go through hard times. Yet he gives us the truth of joy. A joy that's never going to be shaken or taken away from us. God, would you help us to see our circumstances as something that's going to build us up in our faith so that we have a steadfast faith that endures all those things. Help us not to focus on the situation, but focus on the treasures that those trials are going to bring in our life. God, and we thank you. Um, Jesus, we thank you that you endured the cross for us so that we can share in your joy being reconciled to our Father in heaven and being a part of your family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.